welcome to this youtube channel so today is our third uh, discussion related to current affairs of international relations <laughs> today we will take up seven important artic articles which we have to discuss which are very important for your exams and we will try to bring everything which is important into this discussion so let us start without wasting our time let's move to our first article which is about the pokhran nuclear tests as on may 11 2023 india celebrated 25 years of pokhran 2 nuclear test so let us see more about this news let us see what are the important developments and what is and they are to be noted <laughs> yeah pokhran 1 and pokhran 2 tests let's discuss about them first we should know a little bit about the background of it india declared itself a nuclear weapon state after it carried out a series of three nuclear detonations on may 11 1998 so on may 11 1998 india declared itself as a nuclear weapon state these include thermonuclear device along with a fission device and a second test followed two days later and having attained the requisite degree of techno strategic capability india announced a self imposed moratorium on further testing so in nutshell on may 11 1998 after many tests india declared itself as nuclear weapon state these include thermonuclear device and along with fission device and then later second test followed two days later and we have we had attained the request degree of techno strategic capability and india announced a self imposed moratorium on further testing so let's move forward and see what is more about this and this operation uh, was named code named as operation shakti it was second nuclear test by india and uh, india conducted its first nuclear test on may 18 1974 in pokhran so this all started uh, way earlier and in on may 18 1974 india did its first test and its code name was smiling buddha which came from the tests date being on the same day as buddha jayanti so may 18 1974 uh, may 18 was celebrate buddha jayanti so on the same day our first test nuclear test was done and uh, and uh, its code name was given operation smiling buddha and the second test which we did in 1998 uh, its uh, code name was operation shakti and the india's re uh, intentions regarding the development of nuclear weapons they were outlined in the official nuclear doctrine let us see what this official nuclear doctrine is india's nuclear doc doctrine first solution of building building and maintaining a credible minimum deterrent massive nuclear retaliation to inflict unacceptable damage non use of nuclear weapons against non nuclear weapon state and control on export of nuclear and missile related materials and technologies moratorium on nuclear tests and further no first use we follow this policy nuclear weapons will only be used in retaliation if uh, 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 god forbid uh, we are attack attacked uh, some day uh, with the nuclear weapons so in that case we are we will use our nuclear weapon for retaliation and also nuclear attacks can be can only be authorized by civil civilian political leaders through nuclear command authority so it is the civilian civilian political leadership which 
would authorize the nuclear attacks and also retaliation with the nuclear weapons in case of major attacks by biological or chemical weapons. So commitment to the goal of nuclear weapon free world through global verifiable and non-discriminatory nuclear disarmament. Here we should know that uh, what does this nuclear do doctrine state and nuclear doctrine it states how a nuclear weapon state would employ its nuclear weapons both during peace and war. India first released a draft nuclear doctrine in August 1999 and in January 2003 India released its official nuclear doctrine. So this was about India's nuclear doctrine no first use massive nuclear retaliation non-use of nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon state if we ever went for a war with any non-nuclear weapon state we will never use nuclear weapon against them and control on export of nuclear and missiles related materials so this is the india's nuclear doctrine it was first uh, draft released uh, first released draft nuclear doctrine in august 1999 and in January 2003, it was released officially. Let's move. Forward. We have to see about uh, Nuclear Command Authority. It comprises of two, uh, two wings. One is Political Council and the Executive Council. Uh, the Political Council it is chaired by the Prime Minister, sole body which can uh, authorize the use of nuclear weapon. As we discussed it in the last slide, that. It is the civilian leader who will authorize the nuclear attack. So nuclear command authority, it consists of two councils, political council and executive. In political, we have it is chaired by prime minister who will authorize the nuclear weapon attack. And in executive council, it is chaired by the national security advisor who provides inputs for decision making by nuclear command authority and executives directives given by political council. So this is about the nuclear command authority, what it comprises of and who is the decision make, maker for any nuclear attack. Now let us see what is the significance of India becoming a nuclear weapon state. First, it improved international standing. India is now a member of three out of four multilateral multilateral export control regimes, which include MTCR, Vesenegar Marriage uh, Arrangement, Australia Group, and is in the reckoning for membership of the NSG. Came the members of MTCR, which is Missile Technology Control Regime, Vesenegar Arrangement, Australia Group, and is in the reckoning for the membership of the NSG, which is a Nuclear Suppliers Group. And uh, what is stopping India to join this it is China's as their veto system is going on. Then we have security situation along the border as we know with respect to China and Pakistan it has helped balance the military asymmetry by ensuring a credible deterrent. To have a nuclear weapon in such area where you are bordered by China and Pakistan is very important for your security. Let's and also India among foremost globally military powers, India is part of an elite group of global military powers having an operational nuclear raid capacity. That means India can launch nuclear weapons from land, air and sea. So India's capacity to launch nuclear weapons is three dimensional. India can well, launch it from land, it can launch it from air and sea. So it improves the, India's military power. And also energy security for future India has, as we know till now, India has installed, installed generating capacity of 2025 megawatts in 1998 and 99, which has increased by 205% till now, till the financial year 23, which is 6,780 megawatts. So this point is very important. We should uh, uh, again repeat it energy security for the future as when India installed it, it was generating two in 1998 and 99, it was generating 2,225 megawatts and now it has increased by 205% which is 6,780 megawatts in financial year 2023.
And also this uh, helped India to transform its relation with the US as post as by the turn of the century India's relations with the US and the West had begun to crystallize into a substantive relationship with Indo-US civil nuclear deal in 2008 which we signed in India became a de facto nuclear power. An expression of technological capability the most important fallout has been with regards to access to international technology. For example, with the United States, we now have a high-tech defense corporation, the NSSP Next Steps in Strategic Partnership. And also it uh, helped in the India's uh, perception of India and India's national pride. The tests not only helped India prove its scientific capabilities, but it also gave uh, a boost to the global stature of the nation. India has recognized has been recognized as responsible nuclear power as we had never violated, we had never done any sighting which would harm the world. Now let us see why did India choose to exercise the nuclear option in 1998. What were the reasons we chose to exercise this nuclear option? First, before we discuss this, First thing which, which 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 should come to our mind, we should see what who are our neighbors, and what what is the how volatile our borders are. Then we would come to our conclusion directly. Since we are uh, uh, surrounded by China and Pakistan, and we know how notorious they are, and China who had developed uh, their nuclear weapons in 1960s only exactly in 1964 October so it was very important for India to counter it it would had so if India did not had any nuclear weapons we don't we did not have nuclear power it would had suppressed us in many ways so by the as by the mid 90s China had already conducted as many as 45 nuclear tests which increased concerns for for India and also reports were uh, acquiring where uh, it was uh, it was separating that Pakistan was also acquiring nuclear weapons and China was supporting them in developing it. So it was very important for India to counter them also. So let us discuss it as in the slide. Uh, reports of China, Pakistan acquiring nuclear weapons as China had also conducted a nuclear test for Pakistan reportedly in May 1990, thereby boosting Pakistan's nuclear confidence and emboldening it to form to format insurgency in Jammu and Kashmir and Punjab, as these borders are were very volatile then and still now. So it was important for India to develop it. And also we had huge pressure to sign NPT and CTPT. And which uh, if India signed uh, uh, on to CTBT, India would have been closing nuclear option forever. If India refused to sign it, if India refused to sign, it would have to explicitly state why it does not want to sign it. So, uh, did uh, India played very intelligently, and they developed the, uh, we developed our nuclear program. So uh, here uh, we should know that what NPT is, it is a non-proliferation treaty that aims to prevent use of nuclear weapons in peaceful causes of nuclear, you, that aims to prevent use of nuclear weapons in peaceful uses of nuclear, nuclear energy and by CTBT, it, uh, uh, it is full form is Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty by which states agree to ban all nuclear explosions in all environments for military or civilian purposes. So uh, India was huge. India was under huge pressure to sign these treaties. If India would have signed them, then India, then it uh, India would have been closing nuclear options forever. And uh, why by developing nuclear pro program, in, it gave a reason for India to not sign them. And also the existing discriminatory nuclear order where global nuclear governance setup based on NPT had divided the world into the P5 and others 
India, though fully embedded to the peaceful use of atomic energy, was not very happy with the discriminatory world that those five powerful states who had developed it <coughs> about NPT that only though those five states, those five countries would have the nuclear weapons and further it was not allowed under this treaty that any other country would be allowed to sign, would be allowed to have nuclear weapons. So it was very discriminatory in nature and India did not like it. So here a question arises if we have to discuss it that why do we need to revise no first use policy which we, we, which we have uh, regarding our nuclear attacks uh, as we already discussed this no first use policy. It has <clears throat> been criticized on following grounds. For example, it limits strategic space for India Indian decision makers in crisis situations where they have limited room to execute escalation related measures and also continuation of attacks like Kargil in 1999 and the Mumbai attacks in 2008 is seen as evidence of the failure of nuclear deterrence as we are still getting these attacks. So is there, uh, do we need this no first use policy? Because of that policy, the attacking countries, they have that confidence that India won't use it first. So they feel free and they do what notorious things they want to do. If we don't have this policy, they may, it may restrain them while attacking while doing any mischief in our country. Also, nuclear armored states, including in India's neighborhood, are undertaking arsenal expansion on an offensive and defensive capability build up like developing tactical nuclear weapons. And what are the arguments which favor uh, for having this no, no first use policy? It, they are as it awaits pre preemption which would otherwise place considerable pressure on Indian decision makers to carry out a nuclear first strike in the hot heat of a crisis. It helps India avoid the pitfalls of building a technologically advanced nuclear capabilities developed on higher trigger alert, which is financially costly nuclear posture. It also conveys nuclear restraints to the world and India's adversaries ensuring stability. And conventional attacks and incursions can be tackled at the conventional level. So these are a few points which are given in support of non-first use policy, no first use policy. In it, uh, the most important is that uh, these conventional attacks can be solved in a conventional way like uh, we did during uh, the Ori attack, uh, the stri st uh, strategical strikings which we did and like in Balakot after Pulwama attack. So there is no need for to have this policy. We can still defend our pride in a conventional way. So let's move towards next slide. Let's see what it is. It brings us to the challenges of in nuclear domain for India. So let us see. <coughs> First, we would discuss with the continuing Pakistan's use of some sub-conventional warfare despite nuclear deterrence as despite having nuclear weapons uh, we, we are still involved in Pakistan's sub-conventional warfare for example their proxy wars by the help of the uh, their non-military officials and also border skirmishes along in India China border <coughs> and we had, there is no progress on goal of complete disarmament uh, Pakistan one of the challenges Pakistan developing tactical nu nuclear weapons and also fear that limited military engagement could eventually lead to a nuclear war also atomic energy sector has not benefited as much as it should have benefited so these are few challenges related to nuclear domain for India. Let's move to our next article.
article which is about United Nations. Let's see what this article brings us and what are the information we need to know. It was why it was in news because during 49th group of seven G7 summit, India questioned the United Nations ability, ability to effectively prevent conflicts. So as uh, we are in present time, we see different countries who are fighting with each other. For example, Russia, Ukraine, which is going on for uh, two years now. We have Gaza, uh, Gaza, Palestine, Israel war, which is going on. So it, it shows UN's incapability to prevent these things, to prevent these conflicts. So India raised this question in the 49th group summit of G7, where India was invited that uh, UN is not that much able to prevent these conflicts. And also India also raised question regarding why UN had not been able to arrive at a definition of terrorism. It has not um, arrived at that definition yet. There is no proper definition for ter terrorism given by UN. And also India also retreated for the reform in the United Nations and other international organizations, which India has wanted since long that there should be uh, reform in the United Nations and uh, other organizations uh, which are related to UN. So let us move forward, see more about United Nations and uh, the things which we need to know. Let us see why UN uh, is not able to prevent the conflict and uh, resolve them. As we know, Security Council dynamics, UN Security Council, there we have supreme powers and the veto which they have, that is the most deterrent in preventing UN to solve these conflicts and supreme decision making body holds significant power in making decisions led to peace and security. This UN Security Council, it, uh, this is the supreme decision making body which uh, which make which hold significant power in making decisions related to peace and security. But the issue is they have five countries who are having veto and they use that for their personal interests. So that deters it from solving the issues. Let us, uh, 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 you know, read it in a conventional way. Permanent members um, here have veto power, which they use to serve their interests or their partners' interests. For instance, as we had seen China using veto power for the interests for its interests in Pakistan, and also limited enforcement mechanism. Resolution is passed by UN, UN General Assembly lacks enforcement mechanism for the implementation of the decisions is dependent on members, member states to contribute troops and resources to peacekeeping missions and their participation is voluntary. In certain cases, member states are unwilling or unable to commit resources to implement and enforce its resolutions effectively. So UN, UN they, uh, the problem they are having that they have limited enforcement mechanisms as it is majorly dependent, dependent on the, uh, its members and that is very much voluntary to them. So there are cases when countries are unwilling to contribute. <coughs> and also sovereignty and national interests, it plays a huge role in uh, curbing the UN's powers as these values of the nations hinders collective action and compromises the effectiveness of UN inter interventions. And also we see complexity and decisions, involvement of the multiple stakeholders and interests make it difficult for UN to provide a solution which is accepted to everyone. For example, recently a uh, US raised ceasefire for in Palestine, but uh, China and Russia vetoed that because the uh, why they vetoed because uh, US made it very uh, conditional. That was a conditional ceasefire that uh, uh, Gaza Hamas has to release the hostages. Then the ceasefire would be implemented. On that basis, uh, it was uh, a genuine case uh, upheld by uh, U uh, US in the UN Assembly 
but what uh, russia and china they we told it they told that ceasefire is good but releasing of uh, hostile uh, uh, releasing of hostages uh, is it should not be the conditional it, it, there should be ceasefire without any condition and so because of these uh, having these vetoes for the national interests or uh, interests of the country or their personal interests uh, this deters the function of the un and also conflict often involves deep rooted political economic social and religious factors that are difficult to address comprehensively lack of financial resources as we earlier discussed it this limits the un's capacity to implement its initiatives and provide adequate support to countries affected by conflicts and terrorism now let's see how let us discuss about it how un can be more effective so let's see what these points bring us strong, first we have strengthening conflict preventive efforts emphasis should be given on preventive diplomacy and instruments like mediation and reconciliation can be effectively utilized what the writer wants to say here is that mediation and reconciliation it should be more utilized and that uh, these uh, 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 situations arising in the country they should be medi- mediated in a better way in a preventive diplomacy should be done there and these wars what are going on in the what is going on in the world should be prevented also reforms in a, a UNSC more <coughs> UN security council more representation to asian and african nations need to be given in UNSC and also inclusion of countries like india as a permanent member member will uh, promote effective use of veto as uh, we are uh, fighting this case in slang that india should be the permanent member uh, in un and uh, it will promote the effective use of veto powers as india stand has always been on the a kind of anti west Uh, which uh, supports that as we uh, discussed in our last class that south south relationship the developing we have that uh, sympathetic kind of relationship with the all developing countries or underdeveloped countries so if india is added uh, is given that permanent membership in un it would use its veto in a better way and also improving peacekeeping operations and enhancing the training capabilities and mandate of peacekeepers will enhance their effectiveness on the ground they shall not be used as a tool to fulfill the interests of powerful nations so we should enhance the training capabilities of these peacekeepers and also enhancing cooperation with the regional organizations such as the african union european union or association of south east asian nations are seen can strengthen the un's capability to address conflicts and also addressing of root causes we should not directly jump to the uh, <coughs> jump to the solution we should address what are the root causes uh, of any conflict majorly the root causes are poverty in inequality governance issues or human rights violation so it should be the main concern of the un that they should try to address the root cause of the conflict rather jumping directly to the solution and also mobilizing a sufficient resources member states should fulfill their financial commitments and alternative funding mechanisms such as peace building and prevention funds can be explored to support long term peace building initiatives also strengthening the responsibility to protect principle it will promote the trust of people with countries in UN So let's see what is the role played by the United Nation historically let's discuss about it maintenance of peace and security success it successfully negotiated and implemented peace agreements such as the good friday agreement between northern ireland and the uk uh, and the comprehensive peace agreements in sudan UN peacekeeping missions have also contribu- contributed to maintaining stability and facilitating political ten- uh, transitions in various conflict uh, affected areas and also it helped in decolonization and self determination 
General, United Nations General Assembly adopted the declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples in 1960, which helped numerous ter territories in transitioning from colonial rule to sovereign nations. And it has helped in human rights and international human rights and international law. Uh, they are being set up by it with the help of initiatives like Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Also, Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, the UN adopted the 200, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, which includes 17 SDGs, which we should know for our exams. It is making efforts for international corporations to achieve the objectives of sustaining Sustainable Development Goals. And also humanitarian assistance and relief with the help, uh, with the help, it is special, specialized agencies and initiatives such as the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, World Health Organization, and World Food Program. It has transformed the life of millions of people. So it has done great things in developing the world, but there it could have it could have done uh, greater things. But there are the concerns which we saw in the uh, previous slide that uh, you know uh, that uh, stops it doing these things. Let's move to our article, which is about World Trade Organization. First, we should know about it, and then we would go to what why it was in news and what are the issues regarding it. So it is about about it is the principal forum for setting the rules of international trade <coughs> how it came to existence as we know the marrakesh agreement that established the wto was signed in 1994 we should know these points they may come in your exam if not in upsc psc exams your state psc exams they ask such questions uh, at the conclusion, uh, uh, so let's uh, 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 see it again. It was established uh, uh, in Marrakesh Agreement that established the WTO, which was signed in 1994 at the conclusion of the Uruguay Round, conducted from 1987 to 1994 of multilateral trade negotiations. The agreement entered into force on January 1, 1995. Also, we should know that uh, WTO is the successor to the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, a group founded in 1948, whose rules created the modern multilateral trading system. It is members, it has, currently it has 164 members. It is headed by the WTO Director General, is the organization's administrative head overseeing the WTO Secretariat. Function, it facilitates trade negotiations, Monitor, monitors the implementation of trade agreements. It produces research on global trade and economic policy and serves as a forum for setting trade disputes between countries. <coughs> so let's discuss more about World Trade Organization. As India appealed against a ruling by the, uh, uh, let's discuss more about the news, why it is in news and discuss more about it. India appealed, appealed against a ruling by dispute settlement body at the WTO that India violated its zero tariff commitment under information technology agreement. So the zero tariff commitment which India has signed under information technology agreement, there was a case uh, filed against India that India is violating it. The appeal filed before the appellate body, the highest adjudicating authority at the WTO is considered as appeal into the void as the body is currently dysfunctional. What India argued? India argued that at the time of signing of the information technology agreement, products such as smartphones did not exist and hence it was not bound to eliminate tariffs on such items. <coughs> so India is using this clause in their benefit that the items which were not uh, during the signing of this agreement uh, they are not they don't come in this agreement for example smartphones or uh, we have 
uh, improving technologies right now so india says that they don't come under this agreement and also the information technology agreement it covers many high technology products including computers telecommunication equipment semiconductor softwares etc so let us see more about let us uh, move to what are the achievements of wto it a, a wide wide coverage that uh, wto is by far the largest trade body in the world it encompasses more than 85% of the population in the world so this shows how big a trade body it is 95% of the trade that happens across the world is done by wto members and also it transformed international trade binding rules for global trade have facilitated dramatic growth in a cross border business activity rise of global value chains it led to the rise of global value chains the predictable market conditions fostered by the wto wto have combined with the improved communications to enable the rise of global value chains trade within these value chains today accounts for almost 70% of the total merchandise trade so this shows uh, its few achievements let's move and also the non discrimination the wto promotes the principle of non discrimination in trade the most favorable nation principles ensures that countries do not discriminate between trading partners granting them the same favorable treatment given to any other member the national treatment principle ensures that foreign goods and services are treated no less favorable than domestic ones once they enter a member country market so it uh, is based on non discrimination a favorable treatment given to all countries in it and also it has special provisions for developing and least developed countries as uh, the gat and the general agreement on trade in services gats allows <coughs> developing countries some preferential treatment the wto provides technical assistance and capacity building programs to help developing and least developed countries participate effectively in global trade also global cooperation wto membership encourages global cooperation among countries it provides a platform for member countries to engage in discussions and negotiations in various trade related issues including agriculture intellectual property services and investment dispute resolution it uh, wto's trade dispute mechanisms has been used extensively helping to avoid un unilateral responses to dispute so it has done great in world trade it has <coughs> helped in globalization uh, of uh, trade uh, it uh, uh, connected the uh, world together Uh, it gave a form to the world where uh, uh, countries were not discriminated it uh, by its provisions it helped the least developed countries or uh, developing countries so it has done great to the world now let us see what are the key agreements uh, of wto the key agreements are as the agreement on agriculture you know wto often accuses india that uh, the subsidy indian government is giving to the farmers or uh, they are not liking it and uh, for example msp which uh, farmers are demanding for the legalization of msp is uh, now and wto does not like it because uh, it, it they feel that uh, they, it, this would, would lead to stockpiling of the crops and it will it would hamper the global trade and also we have trade related uh, aspects of intellectual property rights then the agreement on technical barriers to trade trade facilitation agreement the general agreement on trade in services then the agreement on trade related investment measures the agreement on the application of sanitary and phytosanitary measures so there are uh, seven majorly seven agreements which uh, wto wto has brought out and they are very important they have developed they had helped in developing the world trade in a better way so what are the issues with wto first is the ne negotiations deadlocks as consensus based decisions are making 
is prevailing here and these concerns in consensus based decision every country has to agree on some decision making so <coughs> it result it often results in negotiation deadlocks it makes it difficult to reach meaningful agreement on crucial issues such as agricultural subsidies intellectual property rights and market access and also developing country concerns developing countries they often argue that developed countries tend to dominate negotiations and have an advantage in shaping the rules of their benefits developing countries often struggle to fully participate in the negotiation process and face challenges in implementing and uh, compl complying with the complex trade rules and standards also rising protectionism and bi bi bilateralism between the uh, countries in the recent years there has been a rise in protectionist measures and a shift towards bilateral or regional trade agreements which bypasses the multi framework of the wto also other emerging issues there are concerns that wto it has not kept pace with the 21st century trade which requires new updates provisions in multilateral agreements several new issues have emerged since 1995 such as the linkages between trade and climate change sdgs gender issues and human rights so it has not kept the pace with the time also members and development states concerns have been raised regarding ability of a certain member to self designate as developing countries and thereby to benefit from the special and differential treatment provisions as uh, it is uh, majorly concerned with china as they are still uh, claiming the states of uh, developing and uh, they gain huge benefits from that so this is one of the concern dispute settlement crisis the wto dispute settlement is in crisis as the us blocked appointments to the appellate body members face challenges enforcing wto obligations without a functioning appeal mechanism as uh, is in this case because why we are uh, discussing about wto because india was challenged <coughs> uh, in uh, in one of the cases regarding uh, zero tariffs as they are uh, violating the zero tariff so because why it is on the hold because the appellate body Uh, they it is blocked uh, the appointment to it has been blocked by us and it is not working so these dispute settlement crisis they pile up we do, we don't come to any uh, solid conclusion because of that and also in adequate monitoring mechanism experts raise concern that wto is unable to identify and address violation of its multilateral agreements in an effective and timely manner now let's move to our fourth article of the day it is about the, the group of 7 g7 as we already discussed 49th summit of g7 group was recently held in hiroshima japan india along with countries like australia brazil etc they were invited to the summit by the india claimed that un has lost has lost its capacity to solve the conflicts in it india gave 10 point action plan to address food development related health and problems currently facing the world so let's see what are these 10 point action plan the 10 point action plan by india it includes inclusive food system that protects the most vulnerable and also the second one is depoliticize global fertilizer supply chains the third is develop an alternate model to fertilizers <coughs> then fourth food stop food wastage to strengthen food security fifth development model inspired by the needs of global south then we have promote holistic health care then we have adopting to millets then we have resilient health care system then promote a digital health care then the final one is ensure mobility of health care professionals so this is the 10 point action plan given by india during this summit we should know that if uh, these questions are often asked in mains we should be able to write it please take note of these points if you are watching till now <coughs> let's see what who are the members of g7 it is canada france japan germany uk 
actually and us if russia is added it becomes g8 and if uh, argentina australia brazil china european union india indonesia mexico saudi arabia south africa south korea and turkey if they are added it would become g20 so who are the members <coughs> of g7 it is canada japan france uk germany us and italy and also the U eu is not its member but it attends the annual summit What was the purpose of G7? Uh, it uh, meets annually to discuss issues such as global economic governance, international security, and energy policy, besides a host of other issues topical to the uh, prevailing situations. Let's move forward. Out, what were the outcomes of the summit? Economic resi resilience and economic security agreed to set up a coordination platform on economic uh, to counter any attempts to weaponize trading and economic dependencies in critical and emerging technologies such as microelectronics they agreed on de-risking commercial ties with china commercial ties with china <coughs> the second one is turned out for artificial intelligence development and adoption of international techni technical standards for trustworthy ai Climate and energy members pledged to achieve net zero emission by 2050 and to limit global warming to 1.5 degree centigrade. They, they also endorsed the G7 Clean Energy Economic Action Plan, which emphasizes the importance trade policies and play main role in reaching net zero emission. And also, resilient global food security, G7 produced a Hiroshima statement on food security action. So these are few outcomes. Uh, De-risking commercial ties with China, uh, trustworthy AI, and also achieving net zero emissions by two, two, 2050, and limiting global warming to 1.5 degree Celsius, and also resilient global food security. These are some outcomes. Let's see what is the uh, how uh, G G7 is relevant to the present geopolitics. As economic power, their collective economic power allows them to shape global economic economic policies, coordinate financial regulations, and address economic challenges such as trade imbalances, currency stability, and financial crisis. As uh, it has a huge economic power. Then second, political influence and international cooperation. They have a strong voice in shaping global agendas such as conflicts, nuclear proliferation, etc. Then we have symbolic importance. The G7 presents a select group of influential democracies with shared values and interests. Then also we have catalyst for global governance. It, it acts as a catalyst for global governance. It has played a key role in the creation of international financial institutions like Financial Action Task Force FATF. <coughs> so, and there is a concern that it is uh, there. Uh, critics say that it has not been so much effective. Let us see why it is not been so much effective. And there we have limited representation and exclusion of key players. The limited representation has been criticized for non adequately reflecting the diversity of the global economy. So, here comes the concept that. Having a huge uh, GDP does not mean that it is inclusive. So as uh, in G7, there are uh, countries which have huge economic power, but it does not mean that it is inclusive. It includes every country. So this inclusion of every country is uh, lagging in it and uh, which limited representation which the, this limited representation has been criticized for not adequately reflecting the diversity of the global economy and political landscape. Also, many argue that emerging economies such as China, India, Brazil, and South Africa uh, should have a greater say should have a greater say in global governance and decision making process. And also, divergence of interests. G7 countries often have diverse national interests, policy priorities and approach to global issues 
This can lead to disagreements and hinder their ability to present a unified front. And also change in global dynamics, the rise of alternative forms such as the G20 has been seen as a response to address the changing global order and also implementation of commitments, implementation of agreed upon policies is hindered by domestic political consideration, differing priorities and the complex nature of global challenge. <coughs> Let's see India and with respect to G7. Opportunities expansion of G7. India may become member of G7 after its expansion along with other potential countries like Australia. Second, we have Global South. India is the is this year's uh, president as uh, India was the president last year for G20, <coughs> which was seen as a crucial bridge between G7 economies and the Global South. And also it would counter China. Uh, China's uh, rising aggression is one of the most important issues of G7 summit. Also other good, re good relation with G7 will enhance India's voice at the global level. Also, it will help in further strengthening bilateral relations with member countries such as US, France, etc. And what are the concerns related to it? Divergence of opinion. All the members of G7 have been vocal against Russia after it invaded Ukraine. However, India stands, stand, we all know what India stand is with this regard. Also, in World Trade Organization, most of the G7 have conflicting views. For instance, they are opposing food subsidies, while India is in favor of food subsidies. Also, commitment initiatives like partnership for global infrastructure and investment are not implemented in letter and spirit ineffective. G7 is not taking effective measures for reforming global institutions and groupings to reflect modern day geopolitical realities. So let's move to the next topic. It is about ADB. Asian Development Bank and India <coughs> Country Partnership Strategy 2023 and 27. Uh, let's discuss about it. Asian Development Bank launched a new country's partnership strategy for India. Let us discuss about it. The Country Partnership Strategy 2023 to 27 will advance uh, Asia Development Bank Strategy 2030. Seven operational uh, priorities. 2030 seven operational priorities under strategy 2030 ADB aims to expand its vision to achieve prosperous inclusive resilient and sustainable Asia and the Pacific while sustaining its efforts to eradicate extreme poverty and also uh, <coughs> cost sharing agreements ADB and domestic cost sharing in the ratio of 70 to 30 for the overall loan portfolio during the uh, country partnership strategy period. It would be 70 to 30. There are three pillars of the strategy. Let's see what they are. First one comes under first. One, first, we have accelerated structural transformation and job creation. It would support investments and strengthen the logistic industry, urban skilling nexus. It would strengthen MSMEs and help them integrate into global value chains. And also it would augment government capacity to catalyze private sector. And it would promote climate resilient green growth. It will, it will support clean energy transition, transport decarbonization, circular economy, climate proofing of physical infrastructure and extra. And also it would deepen social and economic inclusiveness life cycle approach in human capital formation, improved access to quality basic urban services, increase of agricultural productivity through modernizing irrigation and the introduction of improved inputs such as clean planting materials, etc. So these are three pillars. If we have to brief them, we can say under it, first one is accelerate structural transformation and job creation. Then second way about climate resilient green growth. Then third is deep in social and economic inclusiveness. <coughs> Let us discuss more about India ADB partnership. What are the prospects? Over the years, ADB India partnership has manifested in diverse sectors. ADB has provided technical assistance in sectors like agriculture, education, energy, health, and finance, etc. Plus it 
has also aided trade, supply chain, and microfinancing in India. What are the challenges? Different differential approach. India being a diverse nation, ADP faces difficulties in approaching various states with different developmental achievements. It requires a differential approach across and within lower and higher income states. Then support to lower income states focused on basic infrastructure and services to accelerate inclusive growth. Then support to higher income states, including transformative projects marked by replicable innovation and good practices. Then we have private sector investment. ADB supports to boost government infrastructure Financing through non sovereign operations will depend on the volume and type of private sector investment opportunities available. With private sector investment more or less stagnant in India, this becomes a challenge for ADB. So, what are the challenges? If in nutshell, we would say it is the development <coughs> levels in Indian states. Some are very highly developed and some are very underdeveloped. Then it is uh, gives support to lower income states for building infrastructure. It is one of the concern. Then support to higher income states, including transformative projects marked by replicable innovation and good practice. Then private sector investment. It is also one of the challenge in it. Let us see more about Asian Development Bank. It was established in 1966. It has 68 members, of which 49 are from within Asia and the Pacific and 19 outside. India is a founding member. Shareholding in non-borrowing members category US and Japan have the highest shareholding at 15.6% and in borrowing category China and India have 6.4 and 6.3% <coughs> respectively. What is the mandate of Asian Development Bank? Assist us members and partners by providing loan technical assistance to promote social and economic development. It facilitates policy dialogues, providing advisory services and mobilizing financial resources and export credit uh, sources. And what are the key reports published by the ABD in 2023 and 22? We should know that Asia in the global transition to net zero Asian development outlook 2023. We should know that. It may come in the exam, Asia in the Global Transition to Net Zero, Asian Development Outlook 2003. Then they published Asia Economic Integration Report 2023 and Key Indicator for Asia and the Pacific 2022. You know, such questions do come in exam. For example, they may, UPSC may frame it like Asia in the Global Transition to Net Zero. This report is developed by whom? We should say that it should. it is developed by ADB, Asian Development Bank. Similarly, <coughs> India and ADB, as of the end of December 2020, ADB had committed 56.6 billion in 605 public sector loans, grants, and technical assistance in India, as well as 8 billion in private sector investment. And the important projects, which include Vishaka Patnam to Chennai Industrial Corridor Development Program, they had funded there. Then we have Nahaya Sheva Container Terminal uh, Financing Project. Then we have Chennai Metro Rail Investment Project, Assam South Asia Sub Regional Economic Cooperation Corridor, Connectivity Improvement Project, etc. These are few projects where it had invested in India. <coughs> now let's move to our next topic. It is about West Asia. Why it is in news as Saudi Arabia, it hosted a special meeting of the National Security Advisory of India, the US and the UAE. So it hosted this meeting where India, US and UAE were invited. National Security Advisors of India, US and UAE were invited. More on news, meeting was held to advance share vision all the four countries which is to secure and prosperous West Asia. To secure and prosper the West Asia, it was regarding that to share the vision how to secure it and how to make it prosperous. And fundamental notion behind the partnership was to connect South Asia to the Middle East to the United States in a way that promotes economic technology and diplomacy. 
connecting South Asia to Middle East and to the <coughs> United States. Then coming together of these countries is referred as formation of second chord of West Asia. In the making, as we know, first chord it includes India, Israel, United Arab Emirates and uh, United States and the second chord it includes now, which is said it is the formation of second chord it includes india saudi arabia <coughs> and us and uae however this chord is different from the indo-pacific chord having india us japan and australia you know that it is also seen as a success of india's look west policy this is the middle east we should know what are uh, usually this uh, portion is very important for this year's prelims as Houthi rebels which are uh, fire, which are uh, creating por a problem in Gulf of Aden and Bab al-Mandeb Street so uh, which uh, is a kind of proxy war played by Iran here in response to the uh, Gaza Palestine Gala, uh, Palestine Israel war so we have to discuss more about it it would come uh, in the further videos what is the significance of development uh, ties with west asia it will help india to deepen its ties with west asia which serves india's energy and economic interests and has a large diaspora presence then also it will complement earlier initiatives such as in 2021 comprehensive economic partnership agreement was signed between india and uae Additionally, it will enhance opportunity to expand ties with the U.S. beyond Asia. It would strengthen global position. New core development will further align India with other major powers like Russia, Europe, China to address its national and regional concerns strategically. And also peace and security. It will facilitate greater engagement across Western Indian Ocean, which lies between India, Suez Canal and South Africa and also at least 12% of world trade passes we should we know that 12% of the world trade passes through Suez Canal that links the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean via the Red Sea so it is very important to secure that it would help to minimize threats uh, like uh, maritime piracy illegal smuggling of drugs and weapons and terrorism which uh, I gave a little bit on that Houthi rebels which it would come in other uh, discussions then it, it leads to the access to market. It will help to enhance bilateral trade facilities, access to strategic markets in West Asia, starting with the UAE, and could lead to significant job creation in India. Also, it will it can be utilized to promote acceptance of Indian rupee in the region, especially for the payment of oil imports. So it has a huge India has a India may get huge highly benefited by this. <coughs> agreeing by this uh, uh, new forming of cord or by this meat because our uh, market in West Asia is huge and our dependency on West Asia is huge so it is very beneficial for India and as uh, the recent trends from the West uh, Asian main countries for example Saudi Arabia UAE they are uh, moving uh, they had started to move away from Pakistan and it is a huge high time for India to connect with them in a better way also it would help uh, counter China it would help India in countering China uh, China facilitated diplomatic breakthrough between Saudi Arabia and Iran indicated a significant escalation of the Chinese diplomatic footprint in the region as it mediated China mediated between Iran which is the Shia power and the Saudi Arabia which is the Sunni power so it gave the China huge <coughs> huge benefit the, uh, in that issue and China became a huge power there so it would uh, this uh, meet would help India to counter China and also in 2021 Iran and China have signed a long just a 25 year cooperation it thus becomes uh, pertinent for India to establish its footprints to a large extent in the region so what are the issues associated with the new group uh, first we have lack of clarity this they did not uh, clarify they did not give the clarity about the meet strategy goals of this group not clearly stated it is an initial stage of its formation and not much work has been on the ground 
asymmetry among the members. The member nations have asymmetry powers as U.S. is militarily stronger as compared to India, Saudi Arabia, and UAE. Also, cooperation countries in this group have conflicting positions on how to deal with China, Russia, and that may affect the future of the group and its prospects of success for innocent India abstains from voting on Russia-Ukraine war, as we know. Then also strategic autonomy. This group may pose a challenge to, for India. That is, U.S.-sponsored security deal would complicate India's strategic autonomy in the Middle East as a state that chose, chooses not to take sides. And also internal conflict in West Asia. The internal conflict in Arab world may lead to the significant partners of India like Iran splitting from the former into another group. Developing situations might lead to the creation of two groups, China, Pakistan, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, while India, Saudi Arabia, the US, UAE are likely to be on the other side. Now, let's move to the last article of today's discussion. It is about India and Pacific Island countries. And the third forum for the India Pacific Island Corporation Summit held at Port Morris Bay, the capital of Papua New Guinea. India also announced a 12 point development plan for the Pacific Island nations. Development plan, for, uh, plan focuses on the range, range of areas, including healthcare, renewable energy, and cybersecurity. Also, Forum for India Pacific Island Cooperation is a manifestation of India Act East policy and Indo Pacific policy. India has also fostered its relation with them through developmental aid as part of South-South cooperation. Let us see more about Forum for India and Pacific Island Corporation. It was launched in 2014. It includes 14 of the island countries, <coughs> which are Cook Islands, Fiji, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Noro, Niwa, Palo, Papua New Goa, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvala, and Wanato. Other key in for Pacific Islands consists of the three major groups of islands, Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. Here in this map, we can see the Melanesia area, which uh, in the Melanesia area, we have Papua New Guinea, we have Solomon Islands, and we have Micronesia, then we have Polynesia, which contains Cook Islands and other places, as mentioned there. Tonga. Let's move forward. What is the significance? First, we will see the geostrategic sea lanes of the Indo-Pacific region are crucial to international commerce, and the Pacific Islands are at the center of this <coughs> Pacific Island countries. Also, maritime security India with its rising naval capabilities has begun to look beyond the east of Malacca. The Pacific island countries would become inevitably significant in India's broader maritime strategy. Also, economic, uh, these Pacific island countries with their resources, rich exclusive economic zones are source of natural and mineral resources like LNG. Some of the Pacific Island countries have EEZs that are larger than the land mass and EEZ of India taken together. <coughs> Exclusive economic zones of India taken together. And Kiribati, one of the smallest countries alone, has an exclusive economic zone of 3.5 million square kilometers. Regionals and global engagements. Engagement with the, these Pacific island countries allows India to strengthen its network of alliance and partnership in regional and global organizations such as United Nations. And cultural ties with Fiji and Papua New Guinea have significant Indian diaspora com communities with historic ties to India. It contributes to the promotion of the Indian culture, language, education, and trade within, within the Pacific Island nations. What are the challenges to it? Competition from global powers on a regional and global level. These Pacific Island countries have granted, garnered considerable attention from countries such as China, Japan, United States, Russia. So it is very challenging for India to counter these countries. 
and also unutilized trade potential total annual trade is about a merger of 300 million only between the India and these Pacific Island countries. So we have very unutilized trade with them. Our trade with them is very low. And also emphasis on traditional approach. India's foreign policy is focused much more on the Indian Ocean region and the Pacific region, including the uh, and the Pacific region and including the PICs why uh, these Pacific Island countries were relatively neglected by the India. So we need to improve this approach of our foreign policy. We have to include every country in it. Also limited engagement, India's inter interaction with these Pacific island countries still largely resol resolves around its engagement with the Fiji and Papua New Guinea, mainly driven by the presence of seizable Indian diaspora. These are the only two countries with India has some kind of relationship, some kind of engagement. Also, geographical distance, these countries are located far away from India, making physical connectivity and regular engagement difficult. The long distances increase the cost and the time required for travel, trade, and communication. People to people contact, in compar comparison to West and East, there is less emphasis on the people to people contact with these uh, countries, these Pacific island countries. So, this was all about today's discussion. I hope I try to make it very simple and it was basically reading out of the lines as it is very much understood where I felt the need for and, and describing the point I tried to discuss that and rather everything is mentioned in these slides so uh, as I has I had always told you if you don't like my voice please mute it but read these points they are very essential for your exams so thank you very much for hanging me here. I would like it if you would subscribe and like to this channel <coughs> and like these videos. Thank you very much for having me here. Have a good year ahead.